I'll say a few words, and Dave's going to start off on the company formation side. So again, Chris McKenna, proud River Hawk. I was actually graduated, I'm going to age myself, when it was University of uh, Lowell. So I was the last year before I went to UMass Lowell. So, um, so I'm a proud graduate of that year and really proud to be involved and associated with, with UMass. Actually, I have a son, Christopher McKenna, the second who's an electrical engineer like myself, who, who graduated uh, two or three years ago here and is kind of following my footpath. And um, you know, Dave's, a, Dave's not a UMass Lowell graduate, but he's a hockey player, so he knows how strong our hockey team is. And Dave's a, a D1 college player, so he, uh, he appreciates uh, UMass Lowell as well. Um, and I know a lot of you here, um, just Raj and, and Ray, uh, visit. we have one of our clients. And um, so we, we, we've been involved in here for quite some time now. I know some of you folks are, if these are projects for you, working with teams and some of them are going to go on to be companies and, and whatnot and there's always a couple of things that we the building blocks for that one's company formation i mean you got to figure out how to get organized to work together to do something more commercially than versus a student project and then most of you involved in some form of innovation you're doing um, bringing some great ideas together and so intellectual property so those are usually two building blocks so dave and i spend a lot of time in the early stage ecosystem, along with Foley and you know, across the country. We have 25 offices, 1,100 attorneys, East Coast, West Coast. So we spend a lot of time helping companies get, get formed, funded, operate and grow, and, and so on. Um, so here we're in the incubated kind of stage with a lot of companies here, and we'll talk about some of the basics of a company formation and intellectual property. It's meant to be a dialogue. Obviously, we have a PowerPoint presentation, but stop and pause and ask questions because we're here to help you guys get the most out of it. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to my buddy Dave to talk about company formation. Great. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> <good. laughs> so we'll do like 15 or 20 minutes of the corporate stuff that I'm going to do, um, and then Chris will do sort of a, a, a section on IP that will be about the same. Uh, we'll be around after if you have questions, but also it might make sense, you know, after my 15 or 20 minutes, you have questions about corporate stuff I'm going to talk about. Maybe that'd be a good time to ask questions um, because once you get into the IP stuff, things get dizzy and you know, <laughs> you forget about what I talked about. Um, okay, so uh, let's get down to okay. So when you ultimately um, are going to move forward with your business, you need to set up a legal, you don't need to, but you're advised to set up a legal entity. Um, because you can always do things in your own name or you can do it with a partner, you can be an unincorporated entity, it's called a general partnership. Um, but the reason companies don't do that is because there's personal liability to you. Um, whereas if you set up a legal entity, and the typical ones are a corporation, it's either a C corp or an S corp, or a limited liability company, you've all heard about LLCs. The reason you do that is because, um, because they are limited liability entities, which means that so long as you follow appropriate corporate formalities, like you don't commingle your assets with the company's assets, you'll set up a company, you'll have a bank account, that's the company's bank account, that's where the company's funds go, make sure you file tax returns, you make sure you sign important documents in the company's name, not your own name individually. As long as you do these things, then you'll have the statutory protection, which means if the company does something wrong, you can get sued, but, you, you, but you'll, because anybody can sue anybody for anything, but you'll be able to say, no, you have to sue the company because the company did this, I didn't do this individually, and you'll, you'll be protected from a liability standpoint. You'll be able to deflect it back to the company and only the company would really be liable for these actions on behalf of the company. So, so that's why we'd like to choose a legal entity. Um, so as far as you know, which entity do we want to choose? Um, you know, nowadays when you set up a company, everybody's doing a C corp. Uh, five years ago or so, you know, uh, we would have said LLC. Ten years ago, we would have said S corp before the LLC statutes were really being used. So an S corp, to start with the least desirable choice, is a corporation. Uh, that has subchapter S status, which is a section of the tax code that basically says the corporation itself is not a taxpayer. Any income profits will pass up to the individual shareholders of the S Corp. And 
you guys will pay the tax in the tax return, but you get sort of the income that goes with it that will cover your taxes. Whereas a C Corp, which used to be less desirable, has two levels of tax. So if the company's profitable, the C Corp files a tax return, pays a tax, and then it will distribute the money out to the shareholders who then will pay a dividend tax. So there's two levels of tax, whereas with an S Corp, you could bypass that first level of tax and just have it go to the individual shareholders. The LSC statute came into play a while ago, that is maybe 10, 15 years ago, where people really started adopting LLCs. An LLC has the same tax treatment as an S Corp, whereas there's no tax at the entity level, so if you're really profitable as an LLC, no tax. The LLC doesn't pay any tax, it just flows to the individuals who pay a single level of tax. So that's great from an efficiency standpoint. If you have a company that's hugely profitable early on, then you probably want to be an LLC instead of a C Corp because you pay one level of tax. Um, now, the reason you choose an LLC over an S Corp is that LLC, anybody can be a shareholder of an LLC. Whereas an S Corp, it needs to be effectively U.S. taxpayers. So if you have non-U.S. taxpayers that are part of your team, and if they own stock in your S Corp, you blow the S Corp status. But with LLCs, they're much more flexible as to who can own the equity, um, US, non-US. So that's why people ended up being LLCs instead of S-Corps. But now we're back to C-Corps, and that's because of a thing called 1202. So 1202, it's also called Qualified Small Business Stock. Um, it's a section of the code that has evolved over the last few years. Um, and what it says in a nutshell is that when you sell your company, if you get 1202 status, if you do what you're supposed to do, the first $10 million of capital gains tax are free. You don't have to pay cap gains on your first $10 million. Um, it only applies to C-Corps. So um, the reality is when you set up an emerging company, you're generally not profitable for many years. And if you are profitable, you're pushing the profits back in to build your asset base, to build your, you know, your recognition. So you, know, you don't have problem, and I call it a problem, of being hugely profitable on day one um, with emerging companies like the tiny companies you guys would be setting up. So to have an LLC versus a C Corp with one level of tax, it doesn't do you much good, you know, for a lot of these emerging companies until many, many years later when you truly are incredibly profitable, and at that point in time you probably sold the company. Um, so that's why venture capital funds uh, are requiring that you be a C Corp from day one so that they can get the benefit of 1202 status when the company gets sold, they get $10 million tax-free capital gains. Um, so, more of the story is, if you set up a company, you want to do with LRC Corp. That's just what you want to do. You can always flip it to an LLC if you want, but that's what you want to be. If you've already set up a company as an LLC, don't sweat it, you can flip to a C Corp later. Um, everybody chooses Delaware, uh, and that's just because, you know, it's sort of more custom than anything. Years and years ago, Delaware offered very favorable tax treatment if you set up companies in their state. So everybody was setting up companies in Delaware. Delaware developed this great body of law that investors now all understand. Um, so you, that's why you see most public companies at Delaware public companies. It's just they have a very predictable, good body of law. Um, you don't have to set up a Delaware C Corp to get 1202 tax treatment. You can do a Massachusetts C Corp um, or you know any other state, but Delaware just kind of ends up being um, the default, and that's what most investors want. Okay, so to set up a company, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you, know, you file a certificate of incorporation with Delaware, uh, then you need to appoint a board of directors. The board of directors will appoint officers. Um, you want to open up a bank account so that you can, again, you know, distinguish this from your own personal assets. Um, so there's not a lot you need to do, but it's pretty straightforward. You can set up a company in one day. You can use a law firm like ours, you can use LegalZoom, you know, it's really short change to do it. Um, and then a lot of, I would imagine if you guys set up companies, the initial board is gonna be yourself or you and one of your co-partners you're setting it up with. You'll probably be the initial officers and you'll be the sole shareholders initially. So it's all you that will serve in these positions, but you have to have these positions filled, again, to comply with sort of the corporate governance. Um, then there are some other things, you know, depending on what you're doing, you may need a particular license, you know, wherever you're operating. Uh, every year you need to file a tax return, easy to do, especially if you don't have any, if you're not generating any business, it's just more of an information return you file, which you're advised to do, but it's not critical if you don't early on, as long as you catch up at some point. 
you'd have to pay a fee to Delaware every year, which is a few hundred dollars just to stay alive as a company. And then you need to be mindful of sort of state level taxes, sales and use tax once you're, you know, um, once, you're, once you have the business that's up and running. So with companies, really elementary stuff, but you know, you have shareholders that own the company, you have boards of directors that are the ones that run the company, um, that oversee, that make the big decisions, then you have offices who are your day-to-day -day people. Um, so stockholders don't manage the company. Um, again, this goes back to sort of corporate governance. That's what the board of directors and the, um, and the ultimate officers are for. Uh, typically, stockholders will make decisions by majority vote. So major decisions like hiring or firing executive officers, selling the company, these are things that require stockholder approval and it's a majority vote. Um, you see early on founders of companies when they're going to go out and raise money, they have this idea that they have to maintain 51% of the company. That's like critical. Um, and, and we deal with this all the time with founders. But at the end of the day, if you take money from investors, and let's say investors are going to own 20% of the company and you're going to own 80% of the company, you don't control the company. Um, because especially with venture capital deals, um, you have shareholder agreements that are put in place where it basically says, even though we own 20% of the company as investors, there are certain things you're not going to do without our approval. Um, we can't decide the future of the company, but we certainly have to be brought to the table on major decisions. So ultimately, when you raise money, when you bring in investors, you're going to have to have that negotiation about, okay, what are the big decisions, even though we own 80% of the company, what are the big decisions we need your input on? And that's ultimately you know, a decision that will happen at the time of financing. But I think the moral of the story is only 51% of the company, once you bring in investors, doesn't guarantee that you get to call all the shots. Um, so the board of directors, again, they're the ones that sort of you know, manage the business and affairs you know, of the company. Um, you can have one individual as a board member, you can have, you know, you can have many. Um, so early on with the young company, you'll have some investors and you know you might want to do them a favor and you know put them on the board. Um, I think most investors don't want that. They don't want to be on your board. Not until you raise money from uh, investors and you can afford uh, what's called DNO insurance, director and officer liability insurance, because board members have fiduciary duties. So the fiduciary duty is you know, if you're on the board of the company and there are shareholders of the company, then your duty is to the shareholders to make sure the decisions you make are in the best interest of all the shareholders. And there's personal liability to board members who don't exercise their fiduciary duties. Um, so I think early on what I advise my companies is, you know, you have this great advisor who's a you know, professor at, you know, at U Lowell, um, you, know, you, want to put, you want to have them involved, make them an advisor. Put them on the website, identify them as an advisor, but don't make them a board member because they don't want the fiduciary duty. Um, and frankly, you'd rather be on the board because at the end of the day, the board makes the decisions, uh, and I think you probably want to keep that for yourself early on. So I think it's a win-win um, to make them advisors, not board members. When the financing you know, closes, you'll have investors that will want to be on the board that make a condition to being on the board that not only is there contractual indemnification that protects them, but there'll be insurance that's purchased, which is the DNL insurance, which is pretty standard today. And that provides sort of a blanket of protection for, um, uh, for the board members. So the board will choose the officers, CEO, president, secretary, and then you can have whoever else you want, you know, um, CTO, CSO, VP Finance, but there are the statutory officers, which are your president slash CEO, secretary, treasurer, um, and they're the ones that run the day-to-day -day business subject to the oversight of the board. Um, so, you know, we often talk about sort of the scenarios um, where uh, at stockholders, so the officers are the ones that are out there, they're signing the contract in the face of the company. So what happens if you're a major stockholder and you don't like what that officer is doing, you don't like how the CEO is running the company, right? What can you do? Well, you can't fire the CEO because that's the job of the board. So, if you control the company, if you're a shareholder and collectively you own more than 51% and you don't have any special blocking rights in place yet that will happen when you get investors, the power of a shareholder is that the shareholder can say, the majority shareholders can say, 
to the CEO, I don't like the way I run the company, I want you to do it differently. And the CEO says, go pound sand, I'm gonna listen to you, I listen to the board. You then tell the board, the board says, go pound sand, it's, you know, I'm not gonna listen to you. You can fire the board, because if you control the majority of the stock, the majority of the stockholders appoint and can fire the board. So the majority shareholders ultimately can remove the board, and put a new board in place, who they think will be more aligned with them, who then will either get the CEO to do things the way you want or to replace the CEO. So that's kind of a roundabout as to how the stockholders can ultimately control the company, um, but it's a process to get there. Um, so other things to think about in incorporation are intellectual property, which Chris is gonna talk about. Um, if you're, you know, if you, if you are gonna bring in somebody on your team that is, you know, not a U.S. citizen, um, then actually export-import comes into play here. There are all these rules where if you're exporting technology to a different country, then you have to maybe do filings with the U.S. Um, depending upon what it is. So if you have technology, even if you don't have a product yet, but you bring in somebody on your team who's not a U.S. citizen and they have access to this technology, then the U.S. government will say you've actually just exported it because you've just given it to somebody who's not a U.S. citizen, and you know therefore you've exported it to them, who virtually you know whatever country they're from, that's where the export is. So you need to be mindful of you know what technology you have, what the export rules are, um, so that if you and it's not that you should bring people that aren't from the U.S. on your team. It's it's a great thing to do. It's just you need to be mindful of. Export import laws and you know whatever product you have or technology you have, um, you know if, are there any filings that would be required in order to quote export it? Am I doing a medical device or a drug? The FDA comes into play, um, and then employees and contractors. I think is something that you need to be mindful of because what happens is you have these young companies and there are, there are uh, wage and hour laws at the federal and state level. So you're a young company, um, you don't yet have a product, you get a business plan, but you don't have revenue yet. You wanna bring somebody on board uh, and you want them to you know, work really hard and work sort of at the core of the company and help you build it, um, but you don't have money to pay. So what you say is, well, I don't have money, because if, if I make you an employee, then I need to pay you minimum wage, state and federal minimum wage, whatever that is, and I need to do tax withholdings. Um, so that's a real pain, and I don't want to do that. I, you know, we're really just starting this company, so I'm gonna make you an independent contractor. Therefore, I don't have to do withholding. I don't have to pay you minimum wage. Frankly, I don't really have to pay you anything. And I'm gonna sign it, sort of a consulting agreement with you, an independent contractor agreement. And to the extent they give you any pay you anything, they'll give you a 1099 at the end instead of a W-2, uh, and you'll be responsible for your own taxes. So that's what most young companies do. Problem is, um, the wage and hour laws don't respect that. So if the person who you're bringing on, if they're working predominantly for you, you know, you have a requirement that they work in a certain location, they work a certain number of hours a week, and what they're doing is core to your business, they're helping you develop your product, you know, most states will say that person needs to be an employee and that person needs to get paid minimum wage. Um, most companies don't do that. Most companies are in violation of the state wage and federal wage and hour laws. 99% of the time, it never comes back to bite you because ultimately when you raise money, you'll do things properly going forward. But where, where it will happen is, you know, if we see this, you know, far too frequently, we have a disgruntled founder uh, or early you know, early, a person who's part of the team early on will ultimately, you may disagree with them part ways, they'll leave, then you go ahead and get funded. Suddenly they resurface and say, you know, I was talking to a lawyer and I was told I should have been an employee back then. And I should have gotten paid at least minimum wage. And in Massachusetts, there's trouble damages, which means whatever you should have paid me times three is what you get to pay me now. And the problem is the law's on their side. So we always warn companies early on, be very careful about you know, misclassification of employees or contractors. This will come back up in diligence when an investor wants to put money in your company. They always ask these questions and, you know, uh, again, very rarely does it come back to haunt you, but it's something we like to point out. So that puts you in a little bit of a box, right? Because, you know, um, you know cash is tight um, or you don't have any. Uh, 
And this is sort of the thinking, well, we have lots of equity. We think, you know, Chris and I, we, we, we talk with companies all the time about this. You know, we'll say, uh, you know, young company will come in and, and we'll say, well, you know, you're looking to um, raise some money. So we ask them, well, if, some, if, if an investor were to give you a million dollars, what would you give them? What percentage of the company would you give them? And we always get... Like 10%. 10%. Maybe 20. Yeah, but 10% is like 90% of the time. So we say, well, you've just valued your company at $10 million, right? Because you, you're willing to take a million dollars from an investor and you got to give 10%, so you're worth $10 million. But then they want to bring on sort of a co-founder and they want to give the co-founder equity. And we say, okay, well, how much do you want to give your co-founder? I want to give my co-founder 10%. I said, okay, well, if you just give your co-founder 10% that you just bring it on to the team, and they're not going to buy it from you, then that's compensatory. I mean, you're paying them for whatever services they're going to give you, 10%. So what are you paying them? Oh, we're paying them nothing. The company's worthless right now. You know, we don't have a product. Like, Wait a second. You just said it was worth $10 million because if an investor was going to give you a million bucks, you got to give them 10%. But now you're going to give a co-founder 10% and you say that you don't have to do any tax reporting because the company is worthless. I'm like, so that's the dilemma, right? I mean, I'm not going to tell you it's not worthless. I'm not going to tell you it's worth $10 million. I'm just going to tell you that when you use stock as currency, it's very dangerous because this, again, will come out on diligence. You know, they're going to look at how all the stock was issued, when it was issued, what did people pay for it. And do people pay fair market value for it? If they didn't, then that's compensatory and it's taxable. Um, so uh, this just sort of touches upon, you know, you have security loss concerns when you're giving out equity. There's tax concerns that we just talked about. One thing you can do um, is you can give options or warrants. Uh, so what that is, is it's effectively, you know, it's a contract that says, I'm gonna give you 10% of the company in the form of a warrant. So I'm not giving you 10% of the company, I'm giving you a contractual right now. Uh, there's gonna be 10%, you know, let's say it's a thousand shares that are underlying this warrant, and you have a right over the course of X number of years to exercise this warrant and buy that stock. And we're gonna set the price today, whatever the fair market value today is. So there's ways that you can derive that fair market value, there's valuations you can do and the like, but that's really the only way, when your company has value, that you can bring somebody on board, unless they're gonna pay pay for it, that's the only way you can give them equity is in the form of an option that's done properly where you do have an exercise price that's fair market value today, but the value of that option is over time as your company grows, that exercise price stays low at that original fair market value, and in a few years your company's worth a ton of money, and then it gets sold, and then that person exercises the warrant into the sale and they get that whole spread. So that's why people use options and warrants because it's you know, it works from a tax standpoint early on. It's not as efficient as them actually getting equity on day one or buying equity, because if they buy it and they own it and they hold it for at least a year, then when the company gets sold, they get capital gains tax treatment instead of ordinary income, which is what you get with options if you, you know, only sell them in a sale. But unfortunately, you know, there's no easy way to get there if, if, if the individual's not willing to buy the stock. So that's it from a corporate standpoint. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions at this point on what we talked about. So you mentioned um, exports slash imports, like if you were to do work in another country. So let's say you were to have an employee in India. Yep. Is there any like <clears throat> flags or legal, legal ramifications? Do you have to like set up a partner company in that country? How does that work? It's a great question. So let's say you have somebody in India that you want to have develop your IP for you because they have a team. We see that all the time. Uh, or pick any country, Israel, um, where we see that a lot as well. So the first thing you need to do, on the U.S. side, you know, you know, we're fine. I mean, you can have somebody in India or Israel or pick any country doing work for you, and they can sign an independent contractor agreement, um, if that makes sense. Um, but you need to look at the laws of the local jurisdiction. So you need to look at, you know, if you got to be, and we, we actually saw this recently, if you got to be paying somebody in India, and you want to give them a stock option, um, there's separate rules where they need to have, that needs to be issued by a local entity, like an Indian entity. So effectively what you need to do is you need to set up a subsidiary in India, and that subsidiary will be the one that, if it's an employee that employs the, the individual, 
or if you give equity, it needs to go through that entity. And so, so the bottom line is, if you if you're employing somebody from a different country, you need to figure out are there rules within that country about how that person can get paid, and if they can get equity, what are the local rules, and you need, need to comply with that. On the U.S. side, we focus on taxes. So if you got somebody that you're paying in another country, how are you getting the money from your U.S. Com company to that person? Are there treaties with that particular country? Do you need to withhold? You know, how does that work? And if you have to withhold, but then, the, then there's a, a tax the person needs to pay on that side as well, they're getting hit from both sides, so that's why you need to look at the, the treaty that the U.S. will have with the individual country to figure out, you know, the tax efficiency. When you say withhold, what's withholding? Well, withholding is when you have a, well, a couple of things, right? When you have an employee, like if you're working in a company and you get your, your, pay, your pay stub, you'll see the company withheld a portion of your payroll. Okay. And they withhold it, and then ultimately come, it, that goes to the IRS and come tax season, you know, you'll pay your taxes, but a bunch of it's already been withheld by the, com by the company. So, that, so companies have to withhold in the U.S. for, for W-2 for, for, for employees. Um, they don't withhold for 1099s for contra independent contractors, consultants. They just get to give them all the money and that consultant has to pay their own tax. But withholding also has another meaning, which is if you have somebody from, from another country that's doing work for you and you're sending money out, out of the U.S., does the IRS say you have to hold back some of that money for whatever tax reasons? So we can sort out whether you know that person needs to pay a tax in the U.S. or not. Um, so that's what withholding means in that U.S. and not U.S. context. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I was going to ask how um, we hearing about these royalties. How they factor into this? Um, so royalties. Uh, I guess that's can have different contexts. Yeah. These so, royalties, like I'm selling IP and someone's paying me a per something fee. Like or, you have a, you have something you developed and another kind of company wants to yeah, use it. Yeah, they want to get it and then you have to write royalties on it. How, how exactly does that happen? A couple. Well, okay. So you're commercializing your product. I guess what are you selling? Are you selling a product? It would be like a device. Yeah, device. So it's a sales. It's, it's revenue, right? So we don't call that royalty. So when we think of royalties, it's usually tied to a license. Like I'm licensing just IP without the product, or I'm licensing maybe content or media. Let's say you have a, it sounds like you have a product, a device, right? You're going to have a, a sales contract, a purchase contract with somebody to purchase from you. And then they're going to pay you either you know, a check, wire, and that's going to come in as revenue. So we usually consider that revenue, not royalty. <laughs> Royalties is usually tied to some kind of um, other mechanism like a IP licensing. Yeah, so, so you mean so do you mean product sales and revenue or do you mean I something just else? To know about the general idea of it. Okay. okay. Well another example of royalty is we see this a lot with life science companies where you'll have, you know, uh, <clears throat> at one of the universities, one of the hospitals, you'll have a lab and sort of the there'll be research and there are some inventions that are created and those inventions are owned by the university. Right by you know pick your pick your hospital so that the Brigham or partners will, will, will own all this research that are done in the labs in there in the universities. So now you want to set up a company. It's a, you might even be the inventor. You want to set up a company and you want to commercialize that invention. You need to cut a deal with the tech transfer office of the university that that manages all the IP that's created at the university. You need to say I'm setting up a company. I want to use that IP. So you create a license where you, you buy the right to use the IP from the tech transfer office. And what you pay the university to be able to use that IP is a royalty. You'll pay them a certain percentage of your revenues over time, whatever you can negotiate. And you might also give them some equity in the company. But that's another way that a royalty is used. Now, you as an inventor can also invent some intellectual property. And you can find a company that wants to use it. And you can have the same arrangement where they can license it from you and they'll pay you a royalty in order to be able to use your IP. So that's, you know. And, and from a legal perspective, let's talk about the legal implications to your question. One is having an entity from which you sell a product and receive income or revenue by selling it to a third party. You're gonna have some kind of legal agreement to that third party, either a product sales agreement or some kind of license agreement. You have distributors, a distributor agreement with that third party who's purchasing from you. And then once it shows up, then you have the accountant side, which is really less legal, right? There's taxes and implications to it, but obviously you'll have some kind of accountant for that 
you know, revenue on your books, then you have to track that. So at that point, it'd be switching from legal to more accountant type, uh, you know, have an accountant handle your books for you. Uh, and essentially, as companies get bigger, they'll have a chief financial officer who manages the accountant for all that. What's your opinion on the B Corporation? Um, so we don't see much of it. You should take the podium. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we don't see much of it. Um, because it's a nice idea, the B Corporation, but the problem is that the shareholders of the B Corporation don't get the same tax benefits they would get if it was a 501c3, so your typical nonprofit. So although it's nice to have a mission that, you know, is, uh, you know, that meets the criteria of a B Corp, because the investors don't get the tax benefits of a 501c3, you know, it, it's not as exciting, I think, for many investors to invest in a B Corp as it would be in a 501c3. So. You know, and Dave, anecdotally, I've heard they're like harder to manage because you have to maintain the status. Yeah. And there's really not that much to gain. There's filings right? you need to do to, to establish that you can maintain the corp status. And again, <coughs> nice idea, but we just don't see it utilized that much. Because you can have a social benefit, mm -hmm. a social cause for your company without being a B status, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, having a B status requires some other type of governance and work that we've seen a lot of people who actually gone to the, the B status. We wish they did it because yeah. they could get the same benefit by just having this kind of social um, purpose. Yeah. Thank you. One more question, then we'll go to IP. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you do your company's valuation without having a product that you're selling at that point you can have any? Yeah, so it, it's always been difficult, right? Because you don't have anything, right? You have, at least you don't have a company. You got a business plan, right. you know, you have all that stuff. You have good people that are part of your team. So there's value there, but how do you determine it? So the answer is, you know, there's th third-party valuation firms that will do it, but now there's a, there's a company in particular called Carta, C-A-R-T-A, and that's what most young tech companies are using now. So you set up a company, you pay Carta like $1,000 a year or maybe a little more, and they have this great cap table management software that you can use to maintain lots of things about your company, but including issuance of stock and all that stuff, and they'll do a valuation for you once a year. And it's either built into your original price or you pay a little bit more. And they do a professional valuation to give you that, that valuation that you need then to issue stock options. So that's what most people are doing. And, and I guess the follow-up question there is, you know, we keep hearing that we need to give a supply when you get early on, it's like early stages of exploration. Yeah. Do you need to give what? I'm sorry. Piece of the pie. Oh, oh I see. Piece of the pie when you get those, like, let's say, like, seed investors, like, yeah. investors to develop our So usually when you raise money from investors, if they're professional investors, they're going to tell you what the value of your company is. They're going to tell you, I'm going to give you a million dollars and I want X percent of your company. You know, you're not, now if it's, if it's friends and family and angels, they may come to you and they may say, what's your value? Because they're not professional investors. With friends and family and angel, you avoid that by giving out convertible promissory notes or safes, which you may have heard about safe, but basically they're, you know, you give me money, I'm going to give you the equivalent of a promissory note to recognize you just gave me $50,000. And then when a professional investor comes in the future, whatever they negotiate the price per share is, your note's going to convert into that with some type of discount, some thank you for coming in early. So maybe I'll give you a 20% discount to what they're going to pay in the future or some other arrangement. But that's how you can avoid the valuation discussion when you raise money from friends and family early on. You, you, know, you, know, you, you do it that way. And then early on, you can avoid equity by just giving do debt finance, right? Promissory notes, like the safe, right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. You're, not, you're not giving out shares or stock in your company early on. You're giving out promissory notes or safes. Um, yeah, the only time you really need to worry about valuations is if you have stock options to employees, and then you do need your valuation. But investors will recognize that that valuation that Carta does is really kind of for stock options, and they'll understand that's really not what the value of the company is for purposes of their investment. Um, so that's sort of something. And early on, it's just going to family and friends is like, hey, if I was writing a check for you $100,000, how much of the company are you willing to give? That's not set in valuation. So yeah. you know, there's an odd and sign to it. It's usually just. It also ruins relationships. It does, yeah. yeah, you, yeah. Just want, you want to avoid the friends and family. Yeah. You don't want to give them a percent. You just give them a safe or a promissory note, and it's just easier. 
And if you do give percent, how does that dilute out over time as you get more and more investors? Everybody gets diluted. So just Everybody think of share numbers. Yeah, you, know, you have a thousand shares, and you give you give them a hundred shares, and you you have nine hundred. Next time you bring money in, and you sell more shares, you're both being diluted pari passu by whatever you own. And being diluted is not necessarily a bad thing because right. if you're bringing in good and smart money to grow, right, you'd rather own 10% of a billion dollar company than you know 50% of a $10 million company, right? So, we should move to IP yes. because- uh, Time and money. Yeah. yeah. Okay, IP. Who in this room, did, what was that? Everyone who has IP raised their hand. <clears throat> Everyone should be raising their hand. Every single company has IP. Stuff. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, so the problem is when people talk about IP, they think of it as registered forms. I filed a patent, I filed a, a trademark, or I, I registered a copyright. Well, no, you create intellectual property every day. Your knowledge, your processes, your designs, um, some of the, the source code, anything you have, content, right? Every day, customer list, your business plans, that's all intellectual property, right? It's just deciding what to do about it, whether or not to protect it, or how to protect it, right? So I'm a big believer in making IP intentional. And every time I talk to early stage companies, I ask the same question, don't feel bad. They say, I don't have IP. I'm like, they should do. Every single company has IP, full stop. You always do. I'm here to teach you, just at least think about it. You could choose not to protect it or register it, and that's okay. But at least know what it is and decide to do that intentionally, right? So let's. What do we do for protection? Well, let's look at all the different tools that we have, and some of them you know, some of them you may not be thinking of right away. Patent, the right to exclude others, right? So it protects new and useful ideas. They can be expensive, that's because it's giving you a monopoly in protecting an invention. Copyright, right? Um, protects the creative expressions of ideas. Um, so it's a little bit different, it's inexpensive, right? So it's, it's protecting originality. Trademarks is, Protecting the the source or the brand, the mark, right? So you know if you have uh, apples as a brand name, for example, trade secrets is protecting uh, ideas that are of certain value, right? So you things that you don't want anyone else to find about. Maybe it's like a manufacturing process that no one else is going to know about. And the biggest one, usually, though people don't think about, is a tool is contract, right? So think about the things that Dave mentioned. Um, independent contractor agreements, right, is one of the first things in employee agreements. If any of you work for a tech company already, or work for a company, they usually have you some agreement, keep us confidential. Everything you do for us belongs to us, right? Um, maybe you will not compete against us, right? So those are all contractual tools. Early on in every company, we're protecting IP, and the first one always is contractual. Like every single company, standard emerging tech company, startup will have contracts to protect their IP. Different IPs, different types of IP can overlap. So again, people think of like IP just like as a blog or something, right? So I think, I'll give an example like a software application. Software is a good example because it's easy to kind of digest for everyone. Is it got multiple forms of IP protection, right? First, maybe there's a certain function of the software that's patentable. Now I'm not protecting the whole thing because not all of the software is patentable, parts of it are. Um, what's the other one? Copyright. Source of expression, maybe the graphical user interface of how I, how I express that functionality could be registered by copyright. Trademark, maybe I have a certain name of the product, right? That product is named a certain way, and I'm going to tag it a certain way. So that, that's also a registered trademark. Trade secrets, source code. I'm not handing out that source code to everyone. Maybe how I have some memory management or just the source code itself is a trade secret. Contracts, going back to your question about royalties and revenue, I just don't throw the stuff out the door, I want to have agreements with people how they get to use it, right? Because I'm not giving it to them to go copy and sell it to their friends and everyone else, I'm just kind of selling it for their use, right? So there's a, all those tools are used for one piece of software, we can use all those tools. Patents versus trade secret strategy, right? So the US government and all the other foreign governments are willing to give you a monopoly in your idea, right? Um, protect that for 20 years, but the purpose of it is to further the sciences. They say, hey, we're gonna, you need to enable others to learn and get the benefit of the invention. In exchange for that, we'll give you this patent protection, right? So, so you have to disclose 
the inventor to a certain extent, right? As patent attorneys, we, we do it in kind of patent ease, so we don't have to disclose in all the details, but we have to disclose enough to one skilled in the art to do that. Now, trade secrets, you're trying to prevent others from ever getting access to it or, or, or see that, right? So you have to say, hey, I have some companies, well, I'm just going to keep it a trade secret. I'm like, okay, well, let's discuss that. So, again, I'll use software because it's easily accessible to most people. If most people can figure out what my software is doing because I put it on the wild, it's ubiquitous, where's the trade secret? They know how to use it, they've seen it, right? Um, so you really can't keep that a trade secret at a certain point. Now, the flip is true. Just because I can patent protect it doesn't mean I should, right? I may want to keep it a trade secret. For example, software as a service, I have some, you know, maybe, um, uh, an OnlyFans type of website, right? And I have this external um, expression of myself, but, and that's my course, trying to get people on my um, search engine to, to get to use it. But let's say in the back end, I came up with this great memory management invention, right? Am I a memory management company? No. It's in the SaaS platform my back end. Would anyone know I'm using it? No. Would I probably, would I recommend Pan Protected? No, I'd probably say let's keep it a trade secret because no one else is going to. Um, no one else is going to use it. And there's, they provide different forms of protection as a strategy there, but a lot of people say, hey, keep it as a trade secret. Well, let's understand what that means, right? It means no one else can find out about it. Second is trade secrets, in order to infringe a trade secret, someone had to get access and get it from you. It means I reached probably an agreement, like I had a contract with you, and I went in, learned the trade secret, and then applied it when I should. Right? If I go independently create the invention on my own and you have a trade secret, you can't do anything. I independently created it. But in patent, I could not, if, I, if you had a patent and I went off and developed it independently, never saw your website at all, ever, never knew you existed, but copied your invention, you have a case of infringement for me. So there's different levels of protection. But a lot of people, they tend, the reason I make that distinction, a lot of people say, hey, I'm gonna keep it a trade secret. Okay, can you really keep it as a trade secret? And what does that get you? And a lot of times, it's a great answer. So we'll talk about patentability a little bit. Um, I'll talk about it from the concept of the patent office, and then I'll talk about it a little bit more from a tech perspective. Right? So um, it, it is hard. I do this for a living. So you answer the question, is it patentable? Or do I have a, an invention here? That's hard for you to do. Right? That's why you should get out someone to help you. A lot of times, it's because it's engineers. I was an engineer. Everything I do after I've seen it done looks obvious to me, right? So it's like, hey, I, you know, but then I, and I'll talk to an engineers about that. They say, how long do you, how long were you working on that? Oh, I don't know, six months I solved the problem. Okay, well, that seems like a long time for it to be obvious, right? Because otherwise, you do it in an hour or two and be done with it, right? So a lot of the technical folks have mental barriers to what inventions are because we always use hindsight. You can't use hindsight. But this, for any type of technology, it could be software, pharma, biological, mechanical, they're all the same requirements. Requirements, useful, new, and not obvious, right? So useful, it has some functionality. It's just not a piece of paper, right? That's easy, you can toss that one aside. New, it doesn't exist before, right? A lot of times, early stage companies, that's a pretty easy one. I mean, you don't know, you can't exhaust and scorch the earth for, to see what all the competition is, but most of you have started new companies. You're not trying to be just like this company, like a copycat and say, hey, we're just gonna execute better. Some companies do that, and that's a totally fine model. A lot of times you found some white space in there, a problem you solved and no one else has solved. So the new part's pretty easy. The one that's tricky is non-obvious uh, inventive is, is because, again, you can't use hindsight, right? So you gotta make that decision without knowing that the invention exists by saying, hey, if I went out there and took these two pieces of prior art, these two products, would someone just kind of slap them together without any creative effort and get your invention? Usually, probably the answer is no, right? Because someone probably would have done it already and you wouldn't have a company, right? So, but it's really formulating the strategy around that. And some things to think about, too, is that all inventions are made up of prior art. All inventions are made up of prior art. So someone says, hey, I get this one all the time. I'm using some open source code of the stack. Yeah, okay. Everyone else is too, right? So I just want to see what the other slide is before I get back to that one. Okay. Um, so let's think of a build of blocks of a stack. I've right? got a good new software, a web server, just because it's easily accessible. One is service known, yes. Operating systems known, yes. Go grab a bunch of web servers, no, yes. Go grab a bunch of open source projects you know, yes, of course. All of a sudden, you get the static stack sitting there. Does it do what you want it to do? No. 
That's why you put engineers on top of it to build on top of it. That's where you add the buy add any value on top of the add even some new hardware, new firmware, new software, new interfaces because you went and got all the free stuff in the world you get, put it on top of each other, it still doesn't do what you need it to do. So that's where the value you're bringing. And that's where you look for IP. So what I usually ask companies to do when you're thinking about like IP strategy in general is what's new? Do you know of any competitors doing some of your functionality? Right? Um, or any other products. Is it a competitive differentiator? Again, we're not talking about things in the back end. Hey, you know, my, my SaaS is really scalable for some reason, but maybe your, your functionality is really important. The stuff that you'd be emotionally attached to that a selling copy of. Um, and then that's where we develop a strategy around those things. It's a new competitive differentiator because it's hard to figure out what's, what's palatable. And here when I say, what's your white space? We have that prior art stack. Your white space is on top of that. We're looking at functionality there that has strategic value to, that's a competitive differentiator, that you're talking about in your pitches, we do this, no one else does this. And so a lot of times, I'll ask that question about IP, and I'll say, no, I don't have IP. And they'll say, hey, tell me about your company. We're the first ones to do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, hmm, well, you just told me you didn't have IP. How can that be true? I'm confused now, right? Um, and that's the white space of their functionality. So that kind of goes into giving you a different way to look at your products to see where the IP lies, and that's where it is, because that's where you can talk about what you do different. A new thing I like to talk about, we did talk about data. I say data is the new form of IP currency, right? Even being, keeping it private, and being respectful of ownership, data creates a lot of value. We have artificial intelligence engines, and blockchain, and all these things that require data. So, people think of data as a, again, a blob of something. Hey, I give you data, you own it, I own it, and that's it. Is that how the real world works? It really doesn't, right? Even let's talk about like an IoT system on your sensors, feed them into a scalable SaaS platform. Um, some of the data is the, belongs to, let's say if it's a, an agriculture one, some of the data belongs to the farm. He's like, hey, you measure my crops, I want to own that, okay. Some data's from the sensors. Well, I'm, the, I'm the, the provider, I own some of that data. Now it comes into my platform, I have this mix of data. I might have some third party data from the weather channel in town, the, the temperature today. Um, and then I crunch that up and do something else. Well, I own that data too, right? And I have a multi-tenant platform. So the data rights become pretty important in, in that aspect. Um, and even, and that's now, let's say I gotta feed an artificial intelligence engine. And I wanna do it for the benefit of all my tenants. So tenant A, I might say, look, farm, I'm gonna keep all your data anonymized. I'll never, you know, I'll ag I'm going to aggregate and anonymize, but no one knows it came from you because I want to feed into my AI engine and do that for all my tenants to benefit of everybody. But you have to have those rights to do it because people always say, hey, I have my data, I give it to you, only use it for me as a farmer, not anyone else. And if I leave the platform, I don't want anyone else using it. That's not, that doesn't work well for the platform owner because what you're training an AI engine, how are you going to untrain it, right? Um, and, and so you have to think about those things. And then even for certain platforms, again, using kind of a, a, a SaaS model, because we all subscribe to some kind of software as a service in our LA, so it's a good model to understand. Because a lot of times we're buying some primary function. And most of the time, again, your white space of functionality has some unique data flows. You're learning some, and I call it the digital exhaust of user behavior, you're learning a bunch of information about people that's gonna, probably on your platform, you're the only one to have a unique perspective on that. Well, what are you gonna wanna be able to do with that? Again, take away from like purely selling data for advertisement. We're not talking about that, right? We're talking about, hey, I might want to create a dashboard, a benchmark. I might want to upgrade my, some services for my existing customers, make some new products and services, some interfaces, right? So, so the data can be like the second generation of monetization for you, not these unique flows, to create new products and services on top of the platform. That's how you're going to upgrade people. Okay, let's see. IP strategy. First, have one, right? Make it IP decisions intentional. Make it part of the corporate resume. Why do you have one? It validates you, right? So if I tell someone I'm a first mover, I tell someone I'm better, quicker, and faster, what does that mean? I talk to like a, a, a an energy company, manufacturer company, software company, hey, what's your competitive advantage? We're quicker, faster, better. I'm like, okay, the other company said that. What's, what, how do you tie that to your technology, right? What's enabling you to do that? So, some of the IP strategy, figuring out your white space, allows you to protect yourself there. And if you have forms of protection, people use respectful, like, hey, I'm validated. I have 
I'm a, we're you know, a sophisticated tech company. I have some IP protection, right? So you kind of validated who you are. Um, we have, you have to understand all those toolboxes, because some of them you won't use. Some you use in certain situations, some won't, you won't. Um, and the reason, you, and then you always want to make it systematic too, right? So let's look at, and these are some clients we've had, Facebook, Google, right? Why do they have like a, on that search bar, simple, right? You know how many times or nothing? Tens of thousands. Why is that? Because they do this. They look at it over and over again. So every time, every product you have generation 1.0. Well, you see a lot of companies that file one pattern. Well, especially your first mover, you make generation 2.0. Well, you're probably still a first mover because you learn something from your customers and everyone else, and you have new features, enhancements, and functions there, and they look at that and say, can I independently protect those? And they do it over and over again. So all these companies, the reason they have large pound portfolios is because they continuously innovated and they systematically review for IP, so it's not one and done. Uh, coming back to that second um, yeah. part of the first bullet, yeah. when you say increased value, does that mean that uh, having an AP um, will increase their estimation value? Yeah, and yes and no, right? So it, it's part of the whole, it's a perceived value, right? So it's an art and science. So a lot of times, like, only, uh, let me see if I can make a kind of low pulse. Like an early stage company, of course, has some IP, goes some valuation. It just, it strengthens the valuation versus a separate number. If I'm IBM and I have a, business unit who has a gazillion patents on licensing it, well, that business unit has now IP value separately because it's, it's generated that. But if, if you, it's a little bit, IP is not early stage, so there won't be a separate number for your IP. But, you know, if I picked a company, let's say if I'm, I'm an investor, in some of it be intrinsic value, right? And let's say there's two or three companies like yours. One company has all the IP, the other two don't. Which one am I likely to Go, right? Who am I likely to pay a premium for? Now, it may not show up as a line item, right? As, hey, their IP is worth, you know, $1 million on top of that. That's not how it's going to show up, because it's going to show up in that kind of distinction. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? Let's see what else here. Uh, how are we doing on time, Polly? All right? Okay. Yeah. So some of these now a little bit more forward thinking. I, I, uh, I'll go through this a little faster. Best practice, operational considerations, ownership of IP. Um, they talked about that from, you ever hear the concept of diligence, right? So we represent investors who would invest in companies like yourself. Well, or when you go to sell, go to sell yourselves, right? As an IP attorney, the first thing I'm gonna look at is who owns the IP? The reason you start a company, think of a company as a container. It's a container for people to get organized. It's a container to hold your assets, one of them being IP. So the, my job is to make sure that you own all your IP in the company, right? So that means everyone who touched it from day one, all the important stuff, employee or independent contractor, signed an agreement, as we wanted in writing, that they assigned all their rights and title and interest to the IP to the company, right? So early on, right, what do we do? We start projects with friends, we shake hands. Oh, my friend, he's a great developer, he needs some code for me, he goes away, and and we do that, right? That's how startups get started. Nothing wrong with that. But at some point, you gotta formalize it, right? Because uh, I've seen stories where someone's done that work and then the lawyers come back and say, hey, you need to go get that in writing. Oh yeah, it's a good friend of mine. The good friend all of a sudden says, oh, your company's worth 10 million? Yeah, I didn't. I, I wasn't gonna do that for free. I want some equity, right? And you're kind of stuck because you don't want to pay him, but know what? And even though he gave you the tangible form of the IP, for contractors, unless it's a written agreement, they actually own the IP. So any contractor you have, you may own some of the tangible deliverable, unless you have a written agreement, they own the IP, you don't. So you stop at that point. So you have to go pay, you have to go negotiate, and that's it. So that's number one thing we make sure. Then we talked about contractual protection. Anytime you start a company, things we want to make sure is all the employees and contractors have a standard form agreement that keep everything confidential, right? Because that's how we can keep trade secrets and stuff and make sure that they assign the IP to the company, right? So that's why we have these agreements. Um, then there's even things about customers you have to worry about, right? First of all, maybe you have a beta site where the customer wants to keep it confidential, but what things about feedback to your product, right? So you talked about selling something for royalties or about, say, revenue. And if a customer gives me some ideas to implement my product, who owns that, right? There's IP flow in there, right? Most, you know, standard agreements for larger company, product companies say, hey, we 
Either we own the ideas you gave me, or if not, whatever ideas, you can own it, but whatever ideas you get, we get a perpetual license to do whatever we want with it, right? Because we have to, we're the product company. Partnership joint efforts. So what's the natural thing to do? Early stage company, trying to make, get some traction, have some great friends, have, meet these big strategic companies or people that you just want to do joint development. Hey, let's, you have some great ideas, I have some great ideas. Let's get together and do it together. And say, they never talk about the IP, they just talk about making money and what the product would be like. Joint IP is really bad, okay? So let's say you and I own joint IP together with no other written agreement. I can walk away with your IP, do whatever I want with it. Anything, sell it, do whatever. You're like, Chris, wait, we're together, we don't know jointly, but there's all the written agreement, I own it jointly and separately. So I can go do what I want with it, license it, do whatever. That's not the intent, right? So with IP, the issue becomes like who's, one per party should own it and the other one should get licensed. So let's say I'm a product company, I'm working with a third party strategic who's invested in me and who I'm really using it for channels. I want all the stuff that gets made under our agreement to go back on my product. Well, if I'm an investor and that big company owns part of that, if they have all the money to go take and do whatever they want with it. Why would I invest in that? There's the risk there is too high, right? So those are things that people think. Joint IP is like an easy way to solve the ownership of, hey, we'll just own it jointly. No, very bad. Don't ever do that with anybody. Full stop. Just don't. Um, so those are things you have to think about strategically what you're willing to give up in IP. Now, when I say that, there's times when I'm building a custom interface to some third party for them, and it's going to be custom. I'm going to throw it away. If I go do another interface for someone else, I don't need to reuse it. So maybe I let them own it. They're going to give me a bunch of money to get my company stuff. That's that'd be a fine decision, right? So nothing's absolute in that sense, but um, those are things to think about IP in these third party relationships. Patent dates. This is always tricky, especially for early stage companies, and this may freak you out a little bit, right? So. Um, the U.S. government gives you there's something called a public disclosure date. If you publicly disclose your invention, they'll give you a 12-month grace period to file, right? Otherwise, you lose your rights to file. Because the thing is, they don't want you to submarine people and say, hey, I have this invention. I'm going to go sell a gazillion units of these in the next 10 years. Then I'm going to file a patent and get a bunch of competitors and then go sue. That's, you know, there's some, um, for the public policy of giving you the monopoly, they want you to, to disclose early, right? So what's a public disclosure mean? Um, well, there's different goalposts for that. I'll give you a couple. One is, um, if I disclose to someone under some guise of confidentiality, an NDA, not a public disclosure. If I announce a press release that this thing exists without the details of the invention, not a public disclosure. If I go to a trade show and I demo the product to a thousand people, Definitely a public disclosure, right? And then there's everything in between. It's very factual determined. Now, outside the U.S., there's a couple of countries will give you grace periods, but if you ever want to protect outside the U.S., you usually you don't get a grace period. So that's a sensitive date. Now, how many early stage companies they work with say, huh, well, my version 1.0, my prototype, Chris, yeah, that's been over a year. Well, okay, that happens because it takes a while to traction. But wouldn't surprise me, I wouldn't lose sleep over it, right? It is what it is. Remember, you go back to the systematic product, right? You know how many early stage companies are going to go make a better product? They learned from that, they, they improved it, then there's opportunities to go back and protect that, right? So, uh, the difference maker, each of competition, that's probably the structure, obviously. Yeah. Uh, would, would a provisional patent be, would a provisional, provisional patent put a stop to that? So, provisional patents do, so one way to solve that is to do a provisional patent for that. Now the question would be, it's very factual, I'm, I'm looking at Holly right now, because some of it is be like, are the, one argument is this, is everyone at the difference maker under some understanding that it's a confidential situation? Yeah, we could argue that, right? Um, but, and then I have to ask, is your presentation actually disclosed on the invention? A lot of these presentations are high level. The part that we actually would protect may not even be on the slide. So again, the existence of it, like say I have a product that does A, B, and C, but you never tell how A, B, and C works, then you didn't disclose the invention. But if A and B and C uh, is the invention in itself, right? So there's abstract layers there. So let's say you had such a thing. There's a couple ways to look at it. Was the situation, even though everyone's on written NDA, was there expectations of confidentiality? Maybe, maybe not. 
sometimes it doesn't matter what we think. It's when you go to enforce it, it'll be what the third party thinks and will be discovered. Um, then you look at the presentation. Does the presentation disclose the invention you want to protect? It may disclose some of it, but then you work with an IP attorney that might say, well, no, these are the parts. It's not in here. They don't know how to do that yet. We can still have protected it and not be fine. And be fine. In your case, yes, anytime you file something provisional, it protects the, it stops the disclosure date. So a tricky thing, don't get too anxious. Every early stage company deals with it. It's a chicken and egg thing, right? Because sometimes like, hey, do I spend the time and money doing it until I, I get traction? Sometimes not. You know, a lot of it depends, like forming a company in file for patent, a lot of it is a test of are you ready to are you ready to actually start a business, right? Because it's a lot of work, a lot of energy. Right? So a lot of times you have a lot of these great projects here. And at some point your life goals have to say, and I, I've actually had some people at my firm and I coach them just like my son would. I would coach my son's son a company. Uh, is this a project or is it a project turning into a company? It's a company which requires a lot of energy and purpose, right? That's when you say, okay, now it's time to maybe file, get a company going and file a patent. Up to that stage, if you don't know, then you kind of wait and see. Not having a patent early on doesn't mean you're not going to have a successful company, and doesn't mean there won't be other opportunities to patent protect. NDAs, good practice, again, protect the public disclosure for what we just talked about patents. One thing that's tricky about NDAs, um, it doesn't prevent joint collaboration, right? So let's say, uh, was that Ariel? Yeah. yeah. I'll pick on Ariel because he's he, he stepped up to the plate here. You and I are two, two different companies. We signed an NDA, right? So anything I tell you about my invention, you tell me about your invention. We have to keep confidential. Now, what happens if you say, hey, I, I go, Ariel, I have this great invention. It's does stuff to A, B, and C. You go, hey, Chris, how about doing D and E? I'm like, hmm, interesting. Never thought of that. That'd be a great enhancement. Well, that's your idea mixed with my idea, right? So you still have to be careful about collaboration, joint ownership of stuff in there, right? So you want to be, so NDA, I wouldn't necessarily be go free flowing of information, right? It just means you've got to keep it confidential, right? So um, commercialization of uh, IP, things to think about. Anytime you're doing some kind of agreement, it can be a product agreement, license agreement, reseller agreement, purchase agreement, there's always going to be IP. If you're any kind of tech company selling anything, there's going to be some IP considerations, right? A lot of people just take it for granted. Data is going to be another one. You know, being respectful of data, who owns data, what rights you have data. So all that's always in play in these agreements. So you should think about that. So again, make an IP intentional. Reduce IP like leakage by having these agreements, contractual agreements. Um, anytime you're going to kind of do any deal work, if you join whatever, stop and pause and say, hey, am I protecting IP in my company? Um, and uh, when you're going to approach strategic relationships with third parties, don't also just think about the business or commercial terms. Think about where's the IP? Is it, are they giving me IP? I'm giving them IP? Because a lot of times, I'll give this example, like a lot of times um, I have a client who's going through some big strategic and they're looking for some non-recurring engineering dollars or something. And, and they know, hey, with this million bucks, I know what I'm going to build already. I already have the ideas, A, B, and C. But what happens is they don't like document that or protect that or do any IP protection. They go into the scope of the contract now, and now in this, now the ideas are kind of coming through under the terms of the agreement versus, hey, if I walked into the agreement already protecting some of this, they wouldn't even fall in the scope of the agreement because I knew what I was going to do. So a lot of times things strategically about where the agreement's going from an IP perspective, there's contractual things you can protect it, there's IP registration you could do, but then operationally, Right? You don't want to be, sometimes you don't want to be operating under the agreement because you have every right as a company, here's the agreement here, I'm over here now developing something independent from that agreement that I don't want under that agreement, right? So there's sometimes ways to operationally protect your IP that you got to think about as well. Uh, okay, wrap it up fast. Now, IP due diligence, right? So again, if I represent an investor or buyer, you know, acquire you guys, um, first thing I'm looking at is, do you own all the, what IP assets you have? Do you own them all? Are they all in good standing? Then what's the scope and strength of your IP? Uh, you know, does the IP actually protect the core of things that you say that you're good at? Um, and then third party risk. Are you, is IP a competitive advantage or a disadvantage? Let's say you're in, I'll pick a, a space, medical stats with this like crazy litigation, everyone has patents, and you have, let's say a startup had none. Like, oh, have you actually looked at the third-party risk here? Because 
I as an investor don't want to spend two, three million dollars investing to get into a patent suit that all that money's going to go, right? So some companies need to think about the third party landscape as well. So those are again downstream things to, to think about. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit more into uh, freedom to operate consideration? Yeah, so, so just because you have a patent on an idea doesn't mean you don't infringe someone else's patent, right? So it's kind of a an interesting concept. I'll give an example. Let's say um, I have a patent for a steering wheel. You have a patent for a car, right? I can't use my steering wheel on a car because I need a license from you, right? Now, you might be able to drive your car maybe without the steering wheel and figure out some other mechanism, right? So, so let's say I develop a product that has uh, a car and a steering wheel. Then, you know, you're a third party risk to me, right? So freedom of operating considerations is figuring out who else has IP patents in particular in your space that may be a risk to you. It's a complex decision. So not a lot of early stage companies do it. Some do it in certain spaces because it's required. Like medical device could be one of them, for example. So just because you hold a bunch of patents doesn't mean that you may not infringe someone else's patents. And how we look at that first is who's likely to be a threat to you, a competitor. Right, so a lot of times you have a competitive landscape. Let's say I have 10 competitors, what patents do they hold? Some of them may not hold any, so you don't really have any risk. Yeah, there could be some solo inventor somewhere that has a patent that may, may infringe. Frankly, everyone's product probably infringes someone's patent somewhere, you know, so you never can get to risk zero. So the freedom operate concept is understanding that space and really be able to explain it to investors. Early stage companies, I recommend not doing it, right? Um, there's some issues in doing it too, is if I know about someone's patent and I think I infringe it and I take no action, the, the concept of they mentioned trouble damage is trouble three times. So if I'm found to infringe someone else's patent, I knew about it and didn't do anything, then there could be three times of damages. So a lot of it is very practical because entrepreneurs, you're never gonna get to risk zero, never. Any company doesn't get to risk zero. So whether or not you do freedom operate depends on the posture of the company. Um, Think about early stage company. If you're not making any revenue, why is really low risk, right? Because uh, it's very expensive even for big companies to. Why am I going to bother taking you to court? There has to be some business reason, right? Um, so there has to be a lot of money involved. If an early stage company, they're not even on the radar screen. The, the risk is low that you're going to get any kind of suit from any third party. Now, fact patterns can change. For example, if um, you steal the competitor's top three scientists. Yeah, they give, you know, and you call them attention to yourself. So there's always a fact pattern that does that. So a lot of it, we do freedom operate, um, means, you know, that what's the, the white space from an IP perspective, your product operates from third party risk of, of infringing someone else's patents. If you are infringing something, can you just buy a license and no, do it either way? No. Nope. So, it's all so you come to me, I might want to say, nope, I'm going to put you out of business. Okay. I'll give you no license. So you can't, you know, so there's a stress, it's a chess game, right? Because if you come to me, now you just close that you think you're infringed, right? Your answer is like, I don't infringe any patent. So you, first you make sure you go get a patent attorney to say, hey, do we have any defenses why we don't think we're infringed? Because you may look at it, you're not qualified to tell, say whether you infringe or not. So I might come up with an answer like, you don't infringe and this is why, oh, we can invalidate the patent because you don't want to be walking up to someone getting some license. Once you're on the radar screen, like, right, I don't have to get, I, I do not have to give you a license. And then what are you going to do? You're going to tell some investors, hey, I couldn't get a license, and I think I'd infringe. Like, it's, it's, you know, so it's all about managing risk. I mean, it's, com it's a complex kind of minefield that we help you with. Thank you. So it's, it's kind of hard when you do patent search to like really understand where you fall, like if you're infringing or not with that company or that patent. Is the app like is if the application is the same but the technology is different of like your product versus an existing patent? Is that infringing? So when you search, so great question. Let me first answer the search part, right? When you're searching for patents, mostly you're searching for prior art to whether or not you have a patentable invention, whether or not you can protect your invention. You're probably not looking to see if it infringes, right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about what infringement means. A lot of times people look at patents and see the title, the abstract, and oh wow, this is broad coverage. You ever see the numbered paragraphs at the end of a patent? Like one, two, three, four. Those, those are claims, right? Exactly. So for everyone else, that's like um, like a real estate deed. So a real estate deed, 
the meets and bounds of your physical property, the claims of the virtual bounds of your, like, your patent scope, right? So if the patent could talk about all these things and different technologies, doesn't mean if you use those technologies you infringe. You have to, in order to infringe, you have to practice each and every element of the broadest claims. And if you don't, you could practice A and B, say it's A, B, and C, you could practice A, B, and have a C and not infringe, right? So most of the time when you're doing that, you really shouldn't be looking for infringement, frankly. Like, I don't know what the stage of your company is, but you probably should really just be looking to see, you know, if you're looking to do it, most people do a patent search at this stage to determine whether or not they should file a patent, right? Which is different from searching for patents to see whether or not I infringe, right? Because um, you only can infringe one patent, the claim of a patent. So for prior art, right, so the prior art, even though they're patents, the whole document acts like a white paper, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, what the claims or the scopes the claims say or anything. It's just imagine it was like a white paper. So taking these two pieces of white paper, you know, publications, is my invention different? Now, if you do A, B, and C, and I use Java instead of C++, no, that's not going to work, right? But um, my guess is it's probably not as simple as that, you know, so, yeah, so that's something you have to look at. But you're looking at it from a prior art search perspective. Take the document, don't worry about infringement. The claims say, just take it for what the, they say from a prior art perspective, then go back to your white space, right? Um, and then, because the analysis of whether or not you infringe is, is something that's hard for uh, a lay person to do. Because <clears throat> I can stop there. Yeah. IP diligent trade, what's your IP strategy? Do you own your IP? Uh, make sure you understand your product and service. Functional differentiators, and so make sure you protect that, your white space. And know who your competitors are and, and, and differentiate there. And then in some cases, we'll, you need to think about, you know, where do I sit in a third party um, landscape, right? So um, those are some, some considerations there, and thank you.